Hey, what's going on, everybody? My name is Jade Esteban Estrada, the Prada Enchilada, Me Gusta Food, Family, and Stand Up Comedy. the May Gusta podcast. I am your host as always, Jake Reese. And with me today, I have the amazing Jade Esteban Estrada, the Prada Enchilada here with me today. Thank you so much for coming to Jade. I really appreciate you doing this. It's an honor to have you here. I am excited to be here because I don't know if a lot of people know this or they will now, but you're like theater family. Yes. And not only theater family, but you're comedy family. Yes. And you are very specifically theater comedy no comedy theater family <laughs> yes when you yes. stop and think about it because what we did last year mm -hmm. for me will always be remembered as this wonderful journey into physical comedy yeah oh my gosh so just yeah. thinking about that makes me so happy because I'm someone who I'm kind of stationary on stage <laughs> are you I think so okay Again, I don't know what I look like. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we talked about that. I think that, it, well, I think your your persona is so big, so it's hard to think of you as stationary on stage. Maybe you are, though. Maybe physically you are, but I think your persona is so big, it's hard to really think for me to picture you as someone who's here. One of my comedy friends in New York, her name is Liz Murdaka. I've known her forever. We both discovered comedy later. But we've known each other. We knew each other as dancers. We were professional dancers together. Mm -hmm. And when she started, you know, dancers really know how to put themselves together. That's just what they're known for mm -hmm. because it's a visual art, right? So kind of bleeds into the fashion of what they take on later on if they mm -hmm. go into some other thing. And I remember, I'll always remember, it was, it was just a small exchange we had. She was doing um, the Underground. I forget the name of that comedy club in the Greenwich Village. And she was trying out a lot of new material. And she's mm -hmm. very attractive, yeah. but very in-your-face. And so her comedy is in-your-face. And sometimes if you have in-your-face comedy that's not, it's kind of new material, yeah. sometimes it's not always going to go over the way you expect it to. And she once told me very boldly, she goes, well, if you don't like that joke, I just say, look at my boots. <laughs> 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 and I think of my costuming sometimes like that. I'm like, if you don't like my act. Look, at, look at my boots. <laughs> look, <laughs> look at, at my boots. bow. Look at my ears. <laughs> I don't know if you can so, see my ears in this. So I'm glad you brought up you, you being a dancer. So you're, uh, of course, you're an actor, director. Uh, if, if for those of you who don't know, Jay directed me in a play that I was in uh, last September, uh, Un Nuevo Capitulo. You uh, were fantastic. You in were. That. I, I owe that a lot to you. You were a really great director. I, I learned a lot from you. Um, as I'm pretty sure. Everybody's worked with you can say they've learned a lot from you. Um, but so actor, director, I've heard you talk about being a professional dancer. Yes. Um, comedian, of course, stand-up comedian. Mm -hmm. That's what you're focusing on right now. What else don't I know that, that you do? What, singer, I, I'm assuming. So yeah, I, I released an album okay. uh, years ago. Not surprised. Um, and that was the thing that got me this wonderful international audience. But I, I'm also, uh, on occasion, a writer for the Express News. <laughs> okay. So I have a journalism background that I think really helps me in mm -hmm. my comedy. For sure. I was, uh, two weeks ago, at the Rubber City Comedy Festival in Akron, Ohio. Wonderful experience. If you're in the area, definitely support it. It happens at the, at the top of May every year. And they have this thing called, it's, you, you know, every, everybody is familiar with like a roast battle. Mm -hmm. They have a boast rattle boast competition. Rattle. Okay. And what it is, is, is it's instead of the comedians coming up with jokes that are insulting towards each other, a boast rattle is when you have to come up with compliments for each other. Mm. And the thing is, they have to be hilarious. Yeah. And that's the challenge. And a lot of people who are really, like, good at roast battles might really be bad yeah. 
at a boast rattle because, you know, you have to have a black heart, in my opinion, <laughs> in a lot of ways. I like roast battles have always been kind of like, oh, God, I could never do that. I'm too yeah. sensitive. Like, I'm not mean enough. I don't want them to like afterwards. I'd be like, I'm so sorry. That was just a joke. <laughs> well, I did that. Uh-huh. And th- the first round, I remember, you know, you, there's a, you, you're t- sometimes paired with comedians you've never met before. Yeah. And I was paired with a wonderful comedian from Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, his name is James Tanford. And I know so much about him <laughs> because I did a deep <laughs> dive on his social media. Like I went yeah. back and I found a lot of funny things that I could use because he's a wonderful person, but I wanted specifics. Mm-hmm. And so that first round, we were the very first competitors in the very first round. And right off the bat, the judges and the other comedian, James, were like, oh my gosh, you know so much about me <laughs> and you have all this information. And I th- in that moment I went, thank goodness for my journalism background. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like for me, it's normal to dig. Like I'd be a great like investigative reporter. Yeah. Or, or, or like, a, like a, what do you call them? When private you, eye. Private eye. Yeah. I'd be great at that. Yeah. I love that kind of stuff. So it helps me a lot, I think. For sure. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, and so, uh, thank you so much for my, for my boa today. I think uh, blue is your color. That was a good call. Blue, blue is my that was a color. good call. I kind of feel like Hulk Hogan. Do you know, Co- you don't know? I do Hulk know Hogan. who he, he is. He yes. had a, but he had He's boas. quite the showman. Yes. Yes. And so this feels, I feel like Hulk Hogan right now. I love uh, it. You know, minus the racism. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wrestling fans will get that. Uh, but yeah, uh, so your first topic um, is food. Yes. Uh, so I, I, this is interesting. Uh, so I, I, I know that you're from this area, right? San Antonio? Mm-hmm. Born and um, raised. And of course, you're Mexican. Yes. Um, and so... Uh, I know for me and, and uh, I'm I'm half Mexican and so uh, and, and from my experience in my Mexican side of the family, food is a big part of our our culture, a big part of our our life. Like when I go see like my tia, like I'm asking for something for her to make, you know. So what what is it? I guess how does that you know incorporate for you into your life? So I feel like I need to make kind of a a public update about some findings. I mean, I've kind of always knew this about my dad's side of the family. They are purebred-ish Spaniards. Oh, wow. And what I found out recently is on both sides, and I found out about the same time, we're Jewish on both sides. Oh, wow. From two completely different Mm -hmm. places. Um, I don't know if a lot of folks know this, but um, like Spanish Inquisition you know, stuff mm-hmm. like that. A lot of uh, Jews fled to Mexico to hide and they pretended mm-hmm. to be Catholic. <laughs> oh, wow. And so you'd go to the opera and you'd see these, you know, people who were clearly Jewish with these big crosses on their chest, you know, going with their beautiful gowns and stuff. Um, the, on, on, that's my mom's side. On my dad's side, they came through Louisiana okay. and, and they make a big point of the Spanish side of the heritage, which actually is, is a really por- uh, Portuguese. If you really z- zoom in on it, they're mm-hmm. in a, from a part of Spain that's really close. I say that only because I went to Lisbon once and I went, oh my God, everybody <laughs> looks exactly like me. <laughs> like it was the most surreal experience. Yeah. I was like, I am in a whole air, a city full of people who look exactly like me. My same coloring, my same face. It was yeah. weird. I say that because a lot of my, um, the culinary side, the, the, the food side of what we're talking about really comes from my mother's side, which is the Mexican side. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, they were about everything that we would identify as Tex-Mex and, yeah. and subsequently Mex- maybe Mexican food. So what, uh, what were some of your favorites growing up? Well, um, I'm going to say... The things that make me emotionally happy is something that I don't necessarily crave, but I emotionally, I like the emotions that come with it, Mm -hmm. and that's fideo. Okay. So fideo is basically vermicelli 
Yeah. It's what it's called in the way my mother used to make it. Uh, my grandmother, rather. Um, she, you know, she would add a little bit of vegetables here, little vegetables there. And vermicelli is famously very inexpensive. Mm-hmm. So when you're trying to save money, my my grandmother and my grandfather were, were very goal oriented. So mm-hmm. they were very specific about we're buying a car, we're moving to a better house, and that means you're eating vermicelli <laughs> for the next five yeah. years. Yeah. And my grandmother also was big on the refried beans. There was always refried beans on the stove. Fresh tortillas were made mm. probably every two days. And that's how I would wake up because I grew up for the most part with, well, mostly with my grandmother, mm-hmm. as did my brother and sister. Um, and waking up in the morning to that, the you know, the scent of flour tortillas, yeah. you don't unsmell that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm a late riser, like this ungodly hour, like we're having, you know, (laughs) you have to be there at three. I'm like, I'm not even up by then. Um, That's like a a huge motivation to like wake up. Yeah, for sure. Or stay awake. Yeah. As the case might be. (laughs) Um, So uh, do you like to cook? On occasion, yeah. Because I, I too, am goal-oriented, mm-hmm. I will go. Like, the other day, I made uh, jambalaya. Oh, okay. And I was really proud of myself that I made yeah. it. I think I would be a great cook if I applied myself. Yeah. But, and I thought of this when you were going down all the things that I have done in show business. Mm-hmm. I remember there's a wonderful artist. I believe she's Chicago-based now. She's somewhere in that area. Maybe Minneapolis. But she's wonderfully celebrated um, professional. We went to school together and she once told me, oh, we both went to the American Musical and Dramatic Academy and she saw that I was dancing and she saw that I was singing and she saw that I was acting. And I was kind of like doing all three because, Mm -hmm. you know, there was that thing about you have to be a triple threat because at the time the Broadway shows were only hiring people who could do all three. Gone were the days yeah. and the money where you could say we're, we're hiring singers to sing and dancers to dance. You couldn't yeah. do that. People had to do, like if you're familiar with Cabaret, mm-hmm. the, the musical, yeah. that was one of, that was groundbreaking in a lot of ways because you looked at the breakdown in backstage and it clearly said you have to be able to sing, mm-hmm. dance, act, and play the trumpet (laughs) like (laughs) we're gonna utilize every bit of talent that you have and i remember kwanda once telling me one day you're gonna have to choose and i was like choose no i'm all of these things and Mm. more i'm gonna be a fashion designer too (laughs) like i was just gonna be everything right and the more I, i was actually in the business you know as a latin pop singer um And then as an actor, and then, you know, I got dream jobs as artistic directors for two theaters in my career. I realized, you know, you do have to choose if you want to be successful at one thing. And the one thing that I always came back to was humor. Like, Mm. even when I was little, like, my mom and dad are about as funny as malignant cancer. They are not my audience. (laughs) My dad is always trying to be the funniest one in the room. So he was always very like jealous of anything I said. (laughs) And I would say that to his face. But my mother, she like, if there was one thing that my mother said the most of, like if now that you can, you know, do like statistics, if you went back and said, what is the thing your mother told me the most? It's not like I love you or I love you, son. or (laughs) It's you're not funny, Jade. (laughs) Everything. Like, as a matter of fact, over the holidays, Every now and again, you know, I've accepted that I cannot talk about stand-up comedy with mm-hmm. my parents and, for the most part, my family. You know, it's, it's my brother's a, um, a right-wing conspiracy theorist, and, <laughs> and though he's, he's a very talented writer and, and, and actor, and he also did stand-up comedy. We've all got one of those. He's, yeah, and then my sister's a hardcore Christian, so, like, when we hang out, I'm like, what can I say <laughs> that is interesting... <laughs> What's good news? 
So you're and not, doesn't have anything to do with gay stuff. You're not trying to start a fight? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I am an instigator. I oh, will, no. I will start the argument at the family dinner table. I've learned, like, you know, it's it's true. It's like, do you want to do you want to be right or do you want to preserve the relationship? I think about that all the time. Yeah. That's that's what it really boils down to. It's a fork in the road. Every time you think you want to open your mouth, Jake. <laughs> Do you want to win the argument or well, do you want to save the relationship? I'm not, I'm not even trying to win the argument. I just enjoy the chaos. Well, there's love, that. It is fun, especially yeah. if it's boring. It is fun. I have no problem sitting at the dinner table with family and saying, yeah, Biden's doing a great job. Even if I don't believe that, just so I can there stir, you go. stir the shit. Yeah, there you go. Get it going. So over Christmas <laughs> last year, I remember telling my mother, I was like, you know, mom, you know, uh, and I tell her about because I'm a very technical person. So mm-hmm. I'll go, you know, mom, you know what joke I have that has like about a 70 to 85% laugh ratio? And she's like, well, that's an interesting way to look at it. I said, no, I have to know that a certain yeah. joke is going to almost always be successful. I said, and I'll tell her this and that, this and that. And I just remember she most recently, this is how she pushed back. She says like, you know, I don't, and I say this to you, mom, I told her, because I know you're not gonna come see my show. Mm-hmm. And that's okay, I told her. I'm okay with that. Because she came to see my show, and that was awkward once. And so Las Cruces, she, just, <laughs> she kept looking back at everybody going, he's not funny. Don't encourage him. And I'm like, Mom. At your show? At my show. The, she didn't say it. The, she just came. She was in the front row, and I'm doing my show. <laughs> getting, I was killing. Yeah. And she kept looking back at people laughing. So confused. Like, like, what are you hearing that I'm not? Because that's not yeah. funny. Yeah. It was, I'll never forget that. Anyway, so I told her, listen, I know you're not, not going to come see my show. I'm just letting you know about certain things that I say that you know about that I think are interesting because, you know, they resonate with the culture right now or whatever, mm-hmm. you know. It's all about connections and comedy. And she said, no, no, I don't think I will go see your show. And you're right. And I'm glad you accept that, she said. She goes, because I, I, don't, I wouldn't want to be in an atmosphere where everybody's just laughing, just laughing at everything, when they could be, like, talking about their feelings. <laughs> and there was this pause. <laughs> and I said, let's back up a little bit. <laughs> you know it's a comedy club, right? <laughs> And people pay money to not talk about their feelings, yeah, that's, but to laugh. Yeah. And I was like, you know what, Mom? Let's talk about what you want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of your comedy, I mean, you're you're on, you've been on the road a lot this year. I have. Um, so what does food look like for you on the road? Oh my goodness! I'm sure that is uh, tough sometimes, especially. I mean, you you go everywhere. So what is what is um, disappointing in this moment is that I didn't when we decided I decided late on the topics. But what I would have liked to have done is to, you know, tell you the names of some of the restaurants that I've been to. But I will generally tell you the Mm -hmm. things that I've experienced. You know what? The first thing that comes to mind is turtle soup in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Now, Tate, it's great. You know, I know you might like turtles and stuff and they think they're cute, but they're also delicious. Um. Cajun food across the board. Mm. And I think that's why I was like, oh, I'm going back to uh, Louisiana uh, in two <laughs> weeks and get my mouth ready. Some beignets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, um, Shrimp I'm i more about the spicy foods. Mm. Like the beignets are good. Like if you're a tourist, you're going to go to like, you yeah. know, Jackson Square and go do your thing and have the coffees. Um me and my boyfriend had a big fight there, so I, didn't, oh. I don't go there all, uh, that often. <laughs> I don't care anymore. But like, I go there and I'm like, ew, uh, yeah. energy's still here. Um, but I love that the spiciness of of the food that's in in the, in mm-hmm. the whole Baton Rouge Lafayette area. You know, it's just it's it's magical. It's just wonderful, wonderful cuisine. And I am such a Tex-Mex person mm-hmm. that yeah. for me to go to another place and say, dang, yeah. like what have I been missing? Yeah. That That's big for me because mm-hmm. I really, uh, for me, food has always been, like I'm not, I've never really done drugs. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a food person. <laughs> like, Same. You know, I have a lot Same. of friends who, um, you know, good things happen a lot, thank goodness. You know, so there's always a, a call, a reason to celebrate. 
And I have a lot of my friends who are like, all right, let's go to the bar and drink. I'm like, no, let's go to yeah. a restaurant and have yeah. like all the food we can eat. They're like, yep. why would you want to eat? We're celebrating. I'm like, okay, go hang out there with my mom. Because yeah. <laughs> you're out of the game. <laughs> you're disqualified. <laughs> <laughs> that that's for me like I've, I've never really turned to alcohol or drugs as like like food's been like my comfort like if i'm stressed out like i'm gonna eat if i'm feeling happy i'm gonna eat mm -hmm. um so, you know yeah, and that's that. an interesting thing so uh for those for those who uh, i would go ahead and say that you know i i have and had had food addictions i think i mm -hmm. go back and forth i think adrenaline Mm. that we get from stand-up comedy oh, yeah. is kind of an addiction too. That's why I say, <laughs> I don't know if it's I have a food addiction or I had a food addiction or you always have it, whatever. But when you have stand-up comedy, you could go for like a long time mm -hmm. without your other addictions because that particular drug that you experience on the stand-up comedy stage is singular. Yeah. Sure. There's nothing else in the world like it. And For that's sure. why so many people try to do it. And once they realize that it's actual work, they, you know, it kind yeah. of polices itself. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, I know when I come to the San Antonio area, uh, I spent a lot of years here honing my craft. Those fa a lot of the faces are gone. Yeah. And recently, this is how you and I met. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw you with this new generation mm -hmm. of San Antonio comics. I'm like, wow, these guys are, by the way, wonderful people, fresh energy. Mm -hmm supportive in a way that i've never seen a local comedy scene really i love the way you guys are so supportive of each other and it really warms my heart because that's not something you see all the time mm. every city has their there's almost like these prototypes yeah. <laughs> of the different kind there's the negative person there's the person who needs all the attention and posts every two seconds you know there's the person who is really good but will never make the step to a larger city to do more comedy yeah um, every, every, there's, you know, it's, it's just across the board like that, but I really appreciate and, and I, and I love where the San Antonio comedy scene scene is right now. That's great. Because you guys seem to really support each other and that's great. I think that there's definitely clicks and, you know, groups and some are more supportive than others, but I think you're right. Overall, I think there's a, a, a good supportive atmosphere. Um, yeah, like when for I go sure. to like, for instance, like Akron or, you know, I was just in Iowa City or mm. Chicago or I was in Boise and Salt Lake City. And I hear I start to hear the mm. little bit of like, oh, well, da, 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 da. and I'm yeah. like, do you really think you're the only city that has a toxic yeah. comedy scene? And it's not like that yeah. you're dealing with. And I say this with lots of love. A, a room full of narcissists in the room <laughs> and so not everybody knows how to handle it well you yeah. know we, we that's who we are we would not be doing this if we didn't have a little bit a, a lot of it <laughs> <laughs> i'm being modest uh so w you love the food in louisiana mm -hmm. um, where in america has the worst food like where's Where's a place you go and you're like, I'm not going to eat well. When you I'm know, when you say that, I, I, so I, used, I used to live in Japan for a while. Mm. So I'm a, for a whole year, I ate, I, I ate and enjoyed sushi. And mm. I love sushi so much. Unagi, which means mm. eel, is the best. And the mistake I've made over the years, my <laughs> friend, is going to a sushi place in the middle of the country where there's mm. clearly no water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I'm like I like I've learned not to go, oh, I just had a great show in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm gonna go celebrate with sushi. No disrespect to people who have a restaurant there. It's just that I I I am more likely to go to one in San Francisco, San Diego, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. you know, even you know, New York, Miami, whatever, just as long as it's near water. Yeah, I find that I have a better experience. But when you when you first started the question, before you got specific, I do want to say something about huevos rancheros. Mm, that is a personal favorite of mine. Well, hold on, my friend. Oh, okay. hold on, because I, in my naivete, <laughs> have said the same thing. But what we know in San Antonio, and I know you have a broader audience, but in San Antonio, we have huevos rancheros that are wonderful. And they're kind of very specific things. I will ask you, 
just for you know transparency here what what would you expect on a plate of huevos rancheros uh eggs okay salsa mm -hmm. it's pretty much all i need i mean I'm i know not... but what do you get usually what do you mean because usually it comes as a plate but yeah beans so, yeah, like, i don't i don't like beans okay but like it comes with it as well i mean i'll eat it if it's there I'm not really expecting right it and to, sometimes to uh papas ch chopped yeah. up mm -hmm. right yeah um and like every, oh, bacon maybe a little yeah. bacon on the I'm side gonna, i'm gonna eat some tortillas okay of course so here's what's going on towards the west when I'm like, okay, I, I had a great, I had a great, what? I don't know if I'm liking this. I had a great show last night. Maybe I'm still up because of the adrenaline. Uh -huh. I'm going to go have a nice breakfast here in wherever. Arizona, New Mexico, even, you know, Western Texas, definitely California. And what they bring you is shocking. And I look and I'm like, I ordered huevos rancheros and they're like, that's what it is. Okay, so let me tell you about Covina, California. That's the first one that comes to mind. The huevos rancheros were on like chalupas. Okay, no. So they had like chalupa, like uh, mm -hmm. crispy, yeah, yeah. crispy tortilla that was fried. And they put a, a over fried um, egg there. There may be two or three of these and then underneath is a bed of rice. What? Rice. Um, I don't remember beans. Maybe there were a little bit of beans. No papas. And the hottest chili, of course, in the world because it's like, it's just too much. And I'm like, why are you giving me rice? Right. You know? Yeah. And where else was I that that happened? Stop, uh, stop. Uh, from between Vegas and LA, there's a place that has you know, I'm always looking for a place that's open. Like if I'm still, if I'm driving and it's overnight and it's turning into morning, I'm always looking for a place that's early, um, uh, open early. And so I stopped at this place, was it Stockwell? I don't remember. And I stopped and I realized by looking around mm -hmm. why this place was so busy at like 4.35 in the morning. It's because all these people are working out in the fields, mm -hmm. whether they be, I don't know if there's oil fields and California, but like some kind of feels. And I put together and I asked some people, journalism, <laughs> why there are why there's rice on so many huevos rancheros and there and, and it, it made sense after a while after it, it was explained to me. When guys go out in the field and they're working physical labor, carbs. they need the carbs to mm. survive. And I'm like, no, I'm just a glutton. Regular. I'm not gonna move. <laughs> from my seat for 12 hours. I'm not going to be working for 12 hours. Yeah. <laughs> and so now I know not to get, because this is whole, this whole area is known for like, you know, yeah. workers, you know, and, and they get up super early and they come home super late. They're the hardest working people in this country and beyond. And they need that food. Yeah. I don't need that food, <laughs> that much food anyway. And so I learned really quick because I'm someone who like finishes the plate. I'm from the generation of like, you know, there are starving kids in other parts of the world. And I'm like, okay, fine. I'm still, I'm so stuffed, but I have to finish. And now I'm all like, you know what? That's just <laughs> physically impossible for me to finish. Who can eat that much rice at 4.30 in the morning? <laughs> someone who's going to work all day. There's that. There you go. There's that. Um, awesome. Uh, so, and the other topic you wanted to talk about was um, family. We've already touched on a little bit. <clears throat> we did. Uh, so tell me, tell me about your family. My family. Okay, so my family consists of my close family. I'll say that because I think there are tears. Mm -hmm. My close family consists of my sister. Like I said, hardcore Christian. She's a playwright. Um, okay. her, her play was uh, performed. Um, I directed it years ago uh, called Tortilla Heaven. Wonderful play. Uh, my sister's one of the smartest people I know, one of the most intelligent, talented, wonderful people. She, has, she, she like many women mm -hmm. that I know, um, decided to have children and decided to do the I'm all in as a mother mm. because I don't yeah. like what happens when women, uh, and, and this, is, this is a hard choice to make. I'm not making any kind of like a judgment call at all. I, I don't know what it's like, 
But to have to make that choice of I'm going to have my career and be an amazing mother. It's tough. Oh, man. Uh, I can't. My heart goes out to anyone who ever feels they have to make that experience, uh, make that decision. Uh, God bless the theos and the grandmothers yeah. and anyone who steps up to help someone fulfill two dreams, yeah. you know. Because I it's had, important um, that you, you know you want to contribute to the world, yeah. and I don't think it should be uh, available. Those those kind of goals should be only be available to a certain gender. For sure, you know what I mean. For sure, I had a uh, Patricia on last uh, last episode. Patricia Zamora, Zamora yeah, okay. mm -hmm. and uh, that's something we talked about was that find that balance, you know, for her as a mom and and all the things that she does, you know. Um, and so that's, it's tough. It's real tough. I mean, um, being a parent is one of the greatest joys, uh, anyone can have, I think, but it's also hard to, I think, find your identity outside of that. And that, especially for, for moms, cause of the way the world views moms. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. So, uh, that's really awesome that your sister's been able, I guess, to find that balance. You, you know, think? it's really funny. Uh, the way that I can make a connection right away with that is that I don't think I have ever found my identity as a gay individual. Mm. And the reason I say that is because from the get go, <laughs> I was in show business. Yeah. So instead of being at a gay pride, enjoying it, I was on stage. Mm hmm. I was ushered in through the backstage area, performed, and I often would leave. Yeah. And if I hung out, I didn't, I felt kind of like, well, what are we supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and my whole life has been, and I have a joke about this where I'm more of a professional homosexual, <laughs> um, <laughs> because I, I do feel like, yes, I am representing in a very a big way mm -hmm. uh, to a lot of folks, but there are some, um, nuances mm -hmm. that that i i never really got and you know what has really connected me to the gay community in that way i mean as a person yeah um TikTok. okay TikTok and social media i'll, I'll look sure. at things and i'll be like oh, i totally get that but For i wouldn't sure. have gotten that without <laughs> this TikTok video explaining things yeah you know um because there are some things you know, I say this very often that queer comedy is having a moment and there is such a thing as black comedy. There is such a thing as um, blue collar comedy. There's mm -hmm. a thing as a uh, women, women, female comedy. There is. And there's uh, definitely queer comedy. And, and what is meant by that, the reason there's a separation of church and state is that there is certainly a kind of comedy that is really only for a particular or, yeah. or, that, or that resonates more with a particular for sure. group. For sure. I was joking around with my my middle school niece the other day, and she wasn't getting some of the jokes I was saying. She, she said a couple times, I don't get it, I don't get it. <laughs> and she had told me that she was recently gonna transfer from one middle school to another because she wants to go to a school where she would start to get college credits and all that stuff. And just as a joke, I was like, um, so what's up with this transferring from one middle school to another? I mean, well, we all want to do that, right? I mean, college <laughs> credits is really the goal, right? And I made it, I pretended to be here going, oh my God, he's so relatable. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really what, to me, queer comedy can be. There are some jokes where I'm like, why does that not get a laugh? Yeah. Why does that not get a laugh? All right, I'll kill it. <laughs> and one su obviously super gay person who like goes to the clubs and knows the culture sitting in the first row amid amidst all these straight people and i'll say the joke that i'm about to just cut yeah. cut and they go nuts because they get it yeah. and i go okay that goes in the gay set <laughs> yeah and when i say gay set yeah May I say this just from comic to comic yeah. for those comedians who might be listening when you start touring my friends <laughs> you need to be ready to make adjustments mm. and what I mean by that is if you're doing a comedy club that has an eight o'clock show and a 1030 show there are some blue material that goes with your boa <laughs> um, that you maybe you shouldn't say in the eight o'clock show because the eight o'clock show people are they're on a date they might be family, mm. they might be coworkers, and they don't want to laugh about some really blue humor 
in front of the people that they're with. Yeah. Ten thirty show. A late show. They're already, you know, have a, yeah. they had a couple of drinks. They're toasty. They like it loud and dirty. For sure. And as a matter of fact, there's one club that I play in Phoenix, where the promoter came out, the booker came out, and he was like, "Guys, just remember, loud and dirty." And I'm like, "Well, I pretty much feel like I can do that." Well, I realized, oh, you mean loud and dirty. And that was because it was a loud bar, A. Eh? So you had to yeah. be louder than the people who were like yeah. talking over you. And the mic was not that great. Mm -hmm. And then they, I realized that if you talk about family and like relatable stuff, not really interested. The moment you start talking about sex yeah. and adult entertainment, they're all ears. Mm -hmm. And I was like, now I know what that means. Mm -hmm. Then you have to, it, you know, you could be doing a show, everybody's an adult, and then you have two kids in the front row. Mm. You gotta be ready for that. Yeah. Um, you could have one that's all Latinos. You gotta be ready for that. I was not necessarily prepared in Salt Lake City a couple of weeks ago for a place that I didn't know was a gay venue. Mm. Oh, lesbians, trans, <laughs> gay, I was like, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> like I've been performing for straight people for so long and just certainly during my tour like that. I was like, these guys are the harshest critics of fellow mm. gay people on stage being funny because, you know, gay people are naturally very funny, arguably. And so every joke that I did, I was like, they laughed. <laughs> <laughs> so there was that. And then you have um, young people. You know, if you have a group of young people that are, are like, you know, in college or fresh out of college, you know, I was talking to a girl uh, in Washington State after the show, and it made sense for context, I need to say, I said, you know who Joan Rivers is, right? Mm -hmm. She says, no, who's that? I was like, okay, that tells me, you know, someone didn't know who Ellen DeGeneres was a couple of a couple of weeks ago absolutely wow so there's like um and this is that one thing sense. that i always tell um comedians you know especially the young ones uh you know every year in comedy on a new batch of 21 year olds who have no connection to the past no like yeah. personal connection to the 20th century or the past um are coming into comedy clubs yeah and you have to make that your job is to make them laugh For sure. no matter what you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was in Seattle. This happened within two days. I, I was in the middle of Washington in Pasco, and it felt pretty much like a MAGA rally. Like they were, <laughs> and the most misogynistic, like the jokes that were landing, they weren't coming from me, but the jokes that were landing were the ones that were very misogynistic. Like women are not capable of certain things or whatever. Yeah. Those jokes were like killing. And I was like, wow, welcome to 1982. I was like, this is amazing. Yeah. Two days later, I did a show in uh, Seattle, wonderful show called Flock. Uh, it's a queer comedy show. Like 90% of the audience was trans. So not gay, mm -hmm. not lesbian, but trans. Mm -hmm. That's like advanced queer stuff. <laughs> so I'm on stage going, good God in heaven, I hope I don't say anything to offend <laughs> these folks because these people are gonna come after me. Because, as I mentioned before, you know, they're like, um, oh, he's this Jade, he's a queer comedian. I'm like, yeah, I'm a queer comedian from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, a progressive Democrat in Texas is like a, a moderate Republican in yeah. Seattle. Like, you got to do the math. <laughs> so I'm always like, oh, my God, please don't let me say anything. It's going to offend people that I never like. I never looked at the joke that way. Right. Yeah. Like there was a joke I did in Portland, another very, very progressive city. And I came, you know, after the show, this woman came up to me. She goes, hey, really good show. I was like, thank you. She goes, you know that joke you do about, and she described it. And I was like, yeah. She goes, that's actually really offensive to sex workers. And I went, hmm, how? <laughs> <laughs> and I love that about touring is because... You know, in theater, we always say you don't know what your show is about until you put it up in front of people. Mm -hmm. And there is no better way to find out who you are, mm -hmm. what your voice is, how your voice is being received, yeah. than to go on tour and to do all these different... That's my, my tour is called the Jade in America Tour. 
And this is really just, I, the focus seems to be on me and how I walk on stage and gone are the days where I'm known as this gay comedian. Mm -mm. Yeah. Across the board, people approach me and refer to me as trans. Absolutely. Really? Yeah. Uh, women will come up to me and say, my child is the only um, trans uh, child at their elementary school or at their middle school. And, you know, when I see you, I see a future. I see a path for my, for my trans child, you know, living their best life up there. And I'm like, how does that make you feel? It, 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 it leaves me with wonder. Mm -hmm. It leaves me with wonder as in like, wow, you know, you can never have 100% control of, on about how you're received. Mm -hmm. Whether it's what you say or how you come across. I have come into my own. This is absolutely natural and normal for me. And what people will call me, I guarantee you, Jake, is going to change in the 2030s and the 2040s. They're going to mm -hmm. come up with different names. Yeah. They're going to all of a sudden one day they'll say, you know what? Queer is offensive. We just realized. And now it's this word instead. Yeah. They're adding new alphabets. I mean, uh, new letters to the LGBTQIA plus stuff. I just heard. I don't know what it is or what they could be referring to, but hopefully one day it'll just be human. Well, that's why I, <laughs> I think that's why it's important to know yourself and know who you are. Abs absolutely. It doesn't matter what anybody else calls you if you know who you are. And, and that mm -hmm. can be, that's tough, especially for a young person. You absolutely. Know, figuring that out. And not that you get older, it gets any easier. I, you could argue it gets harder uh, the more you find out about yourself and figuring out what that looks like. Right. That's tough. Mm -hmm. And especially in, in this age of uh, social media, you know, TikTok and Instagram. And how things can be taken out of context For and sure. how, how things can be labeled without that person's consent. Mm, yeah. You know, uh, that's the nice thing. You know, it's a double-edged sword. It's a nice thing, and, and it's a dangerous thing about stand-up comedy, you know, because we see so many of our colleagues, you know, getting canceled for something that they said, and maybe whether they meant it or not, especially with the older comedians, and this goes back to what happened with Michael Richards from, is that his name, from, from Seinfeld? He was one of the first so, yeah. famous comedians who was recorded and then it was taken out of context. And I remember when that happened and mm -hmm. Jerry Seinfeld went on Letterman, I think, to defend him. I remember going, this is just the beginning of all this. Yeah. Because now that people had a way to record, they could also edit to mm -hmm. their heart's desire and make it make the clip any way they want. I was uh I was I saw a clip of Dave Chappelle. Uh he was talking about about that. <clears throat> you know, with, with him saying the N-word, uh, mm. the guy from Seinfeld, and uh, Dave Chappelle said, um, uh, you know, there's two halves of me. There's the black half and the comedian half. And he said, and the black, the, the comedian half of me was thinking, he's having a bad set. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I thought, I thought, yeah, yeah, that is that is a nightmare. That is that is a bad set. Like, yeah, I, f I feel for him right. He's he's not going well up there. Let's give him the light. Get him off of there. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, you know, I hang with just because of the nature of of the times. I suppose mm -hmm. with a lot of uh, queer activists, and we'll both receive something at the same time. Whether we're watching a monitor backstage, you know, and somebody says something that is hilarious but can be viewed through a le through a queer lens as offensive you know the the activists will be like that's offensive and i'm mm -hmm. like yeah huh, huh, huh. <laughs> like it's kind of funny though yeah. the the, yeah. the comedian side of me is laughing not the queer side of me i'm absolutely affronted <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh there there are times where i run jokes by somebody and uh They'll look at me and they'll say, I don't know. I'm like, but is it funny? They're like, yeah, it's funny, but I don't know if you should say that. Right. There's <laughs> a lot of that. I remember I knew someone in my family who was a filmmaker and they did something in the film that I found incredibly offensive. Mm -hmm. And they were so excited to show it to me because for them, it was like, we're advocating queer representation. And mm -hmm. I was like, wow that is not, not what way. i just saw 
that was so incredibly offensive. Yeah. Like that, the fact that you wrote and shot and edited <laughs> and released this tells me that you think this, this, and this, and this, and I am so incredibly offended. Like, yeah, that was before I loosened up and became a comedian. <laughs> now everything's on the table. <laughs> but going back to your theme mm -hmm. or our theme of family, yeah, it is so nice. I'm going to give you some context. For a brief time, my family were Jehovah's Witnesses. And what was nice about Jehovah's Witnesses, which I saw a long time ago, was that because there was only one book you're supposed to read, one Bible, and all of these subsequent books mm -hmm. of, about religion, you knew that every Jehovah's Witness you met was schooled in the same way. Yeah. And for the most part, thought the same way. And it's one thing I loved about, uh, loved, appreciated when I'd hook up with someone mm -hmm. and like, I'd go, like this is a long time ago. I don't do it anymore. <laughs> okay, uh, sure. A long time ago. Um, I'd hook up with someone and this happens several times. So whatever. Um, I'd sit there in this person's house, right? And I, I always, I always, I always believe this. I still stand by this. You learn so much about someone by looking at the books on their bookcase. Hmm. I looked and I was like, are you a Jehovah's Witness? <laughs> and they're like, yes, why? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, me too, dude. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Jehovah's so mad at us right now. <laughs> we can't possibly have sex. <laughs> My point is. Total mood killer. Total mood killer. My point is. Um, it's so beautiful, Jake, to walk into an open mic or walk into a comedy festival and know that everyone is there because they have no other choice in their heart but to try to make people laugh. God, it's such a beautiful thing to be around other comedians and to be like, yo, dude, um, can I crash on your couch? Or yeah. what, if there's anything that's comedy related, you know that... The umbrella reason is the show, mm. is yeah. the joke. Yeah. And it's the most beautiful thing when a stranger who is a comedian comes up. I mean, this is, again, arguable. But someone who doesn't know you, but if they're like a very, you know, successful comedian, someone who doesn't know you comes up and be like, hey, loved your set. May I offer you a tag? And you're like, absolutely. And it's hilarious and it works. Mm -hmm. That is... That is, for those of you who don't know, a tag is um, an extra joke to say at the end of mm -hmm. your joke that yeah. might be something that you never heard, thought, but because they're watching you, they're like, you know what, uh, the f f formulaically, is that a word? Uh, yeah. This might work, work. Yeah. to get a, a secondary laugh. And so it's like a gift. The, one of the biggest gifts a, comedy, a comedian can give another comedian is a tag. And... It's just beautiful to see that. I think every culture has something like that. For sure. And when you say family, mm -hmm. being on the road with my family and meeting and connecting with my family that I didn't know, but like Jehovah's Witnesses, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we all know that we all, we all think the same things. We have the same language. We know what, we know what setups, we know what premises, we know punchlines. Um, we all have bad shows sometimes. Mm -hmm. We all have great shows sometimes. We all know that we need to hold for laughs. All these conversations that we've been having this past hour, you could have with any comedian. For sure. Uh, f who's on a certain level. And it's just nice because yeah. they're going to tell you, oh, you know, in England, it's, it's like that, but because, and they'll tell you these nuances, or in Australia or Canada. It's just nice. It's yeah. really nice. I think someone taking the time, no matter who they are, taking the time to say, hey, this is what I thought, or this is, you know, I heard your set, and even if it's just, hey, great set. Like, taking the time to say that, that, that means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. um, I had someone do that uh, a couple weeks ago, um, come after and say, hey, you know, can I give you some advice? And they were they're a pretty well known like you know comedian been doing comedy for twenty years and getting that advice from them just felt felt good mm -hmm. you know and so people taking the time and effort to to do that whether it helps or not it it's just 
I, I don't know if like I I've ever gotten that in any other community. You know, outside of the stand-up community, mm-hmm. um, because I, they want you to be yeah better. And what does that mean? Funnier, more effective. Mm-hmm. You know, it it makes all of comedy better for sure. If if we all contribute to the great set, yeah, <laughs> of <absolutely>. life, <laughs> you know. And and here's an interesting thing about uh, the intersectionality of of my disciplines. You know, as a director, as uh, an acting teacher. When I have a comedian who I don't know is focusing, like happens to be looking at me during his setup and then his punchline, and I don't laugh at the punchline because I didn't understand the words he (laughs) said because he was mumbling or something. The acting teacher in me is like, do I say anything? Does this fall under he's not taking your acting class and he's not going to be receptive to a voice and speech note? Or is this a comedy thing where I'm like, dude, I didn't understand the punchline yeah. because he mumbled. Like, where like where do I draw that line mm-hmm. as Jade Esteban Estrada? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because which Jade Esteban Estrada are you signing up for right now? Because, like, tags are one thing, but voice and speech things, I mean, it pains it hurts my heart when I see a, a, a like I'll ask and be like, hey, what, what was that punchline? And they'll tell me and I'll laugh. And I'm like, I didn't hear that on stage, dude. Yeah. Because you're so cool that you were mumbling. <laughs> like, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> oh, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier about how how people perceive you and about how people see you. Like you you don't see yourself the way the world sees you sometimes. And so I think that feedback is important. Yeah. And you know what? Someone else was asking me, because I think this is going to be my fourth or fifth comedy festival this year, and we're only going to be like in June. And someone asked me, like, well, why are you doing so many comedy festivals? And I'm quick to say, dude, there's no university of comedy anywhere. Yeah. Like, this is it. We we learn by watching. I go to, when I do a comedy, when I have the good fortune of being accepted into a comedy festival, I mark in my calendar that there's nothing else you're doing in that city, no matter who's there, family, friends, hookups from the <laughs> 90s, <laughs> um, who you never forgot. Um, you are the going Jehovah's to. Witness. Hey, Jehovah's Witnesses <laughs> all over the world, my friends. Um, you're going to, everything that's scheduled, you're going to. Mm-hmm. You know, your shows are the exclusion because you got to get ready and all that good stuff. But I go to every show that I can go to because across the board, I'll I'll see someone set and I'm like, I did not know you could do that. Mm. Or I've never seen anyone do that kind of um, playing their opposites or like, that's not just a double entendre. That's like a quadruple entendre. Like... That is so interesting Mm -hmm. that this person or a character based. I'm always impressed by people who are like, I'm not going to be myself. I'm going to be a character and see how it works. Persona. Mm -hmm. And musical comedy acts that, you know, fall under the guise of stand up. Like I, I, I love that's why I like fringe festivals. I always walk out going, I didn't know you could do that. Mm. Or that informs me why my particular uh, thing is is better. Mm-hmm. Or it's not as good because I just learned something new. For sure. You know? Yeah. Every now and again, you walk out going, I think I finally got this formula that I never learned about. Why? Because there's no University of Comedy <laughs> anywhere. That's why. <laughs> and and you have to learn by seeing shows. My sister once said, in order mm. to be a great writer, you have to also be a great reader. Mm. Like, you have to really, like, yeah. see what's out there. Learn the rules. Then you can break them. And in comedy... You shouldn't miss out any. That's why I think it's wonderful when the main comedy club in every city allows their local comedians to come see the show for free. That's a great thing for For comedy because it's saying, you know what? You need to come and watch this great comedian. Forget his credits. He is a master at stand-up comedy. Come see him. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm. Yeah. I've definitely... uh, (laughs) it's, It's frustrating to see new comedians... Uh, get up there and not have a sense of direction, mm. not have a sense of setup, punch, tag, ta- you know what I mean? And so I, that growth um, is important. And yeah, I think seeing other comedians perform. I is think important. what you just said is 
is connected to the idea that the magic of stand-up comedy is that we make it look effortless. Mm, yeah. And so people who buy into the marketing of that mm -hmm. go, oh, you don't have to do anything. It's like when people come up to me, Jake, Jake, seriously, people come up to me and be like, you're so lucky. You only work for like 45 to an hour uh, every, you know, every day or whatever. And I'm all like, I'm about to cut you. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm looking at the place in your face where I could like make the most damage. You don't. <laughs> because you don't understand. Effort. effort. All of the things that are, stand-up comedy is like having 20 full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. But the main jobs are booking yourself, A, or mm -hmm. working with others who book you, um, writing new material, and then you're the marketing. So yeah. you're marketing yourself, you're booking yourself, and none of these things are related. Yeah. None of them. You, you can do tons of marketing. You got a show? <laughs> yeah. You could do tons of marketing. You can do tons of writing on your, your set. Have you booked yourself? <laughs> yeah. They're not related at all. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a lot of skills you got to acquire and, and, and uh, hone. Mm -hmm. uh, something I'm learning uh, when it comes to marketing and social media. I, do, I don't know that you ever finish learning that. I really don't. Yeah. Because guess what? In a year from now, It'll be right now you have your TikToks, you have, you know, certain social media outlets that are like important. It'll be different in a year. It'll be unrecognizable yeah. in five. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, well, I think we're running out of time a little bit here. Um, but uh, I really appreciate you coming on. And I it's had been such a, a wonderful time talking about talking food and family. Yes. Um, so I know you're on tour right now. What, do you want to promote any upcoming tour dates you have uh, soon? Well, I'm going to be at the um, LGBT LOL Comedy Festival in New Orleans. Okay. That's like uh, June 2nd through 4th. I'm going to be all over the Southwest. I'm going back to Seattle, celebrating Pride over there, doing a, a, a show. Uh, the brand new com uh, Capitol Hill Comedy Bar, which I'm really excited about that. And then I'm heading to the East. I'm all over the country. If you check out my website, uh, getjaded.com get is my website. Uh, I'm on social media. Uh, the Prada Enchilada is where you can find me on Instagram, where I post everything. And try to try to keep up with every all the changes. There are, Another thing you have to really do and be in when you're touring like this is you have to be flexible. Mm -hmm. You have to be, things change all the time. Um, you know, audiences are always different. Venues are always different. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten ready in the most beautiful dressing rooms I've ever seen. And then the next night I'm in my car in the rain <laughs> <laughs> putting on and I literally walk through mud and walk on stage and it's, you have to be flexible yeah. because the most important thing is getting those laughs. For sure. There's nothing else that matters. Awesome. So getjaded.com um, mm -hmm. and they can find you uh, the Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, the Prada, the Prada Enchilada, Enchilada on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Uh, and uh, you can find me on Instagram at I am Jake Reese. Um, you can catch me at the Lucky Duck Monday nights at 8 o'clock for the Lucky Duck Comedy Open Mic Night. Uh, Friday nights at the Blind Tiger at the Midnight Show. Uh, and if you're listening to this, please like and subscribe. If you're watching it on YouTube on the Barbara Crow Core Network, please like and subscribe to that. Or if you're on Spotify, please like and subscribe to the podcast. I uh, really appreciate all your support. Thank you again, Jade, for coming. I really appreciate Such it. Such a it's pleasure. A Thank you, Jade. Uh, and uh, comedy theater family in the yes. house. <laughs> yes. And thank you so much for my boa. Uh, I love it. It's so you. It's, yeah, I feel I feel amazing. Thank yes. you. Awesome. You look vibrant. Thank you. All righty. <laughs> thank you guys. <laughs>